Thank you, Mr. President. Um, just a brief, brief summary of where I think we are right now. Uh, yesterday, I went through the bill in, in some detail, section by section, to give an overview. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions that members may have about the sections um, that I discussed. Um, but absent any questions, it would be my intent to take my seat um, and then let others be heard. But that being said, I am willing to take questions. I realize I've talked to some members and they believe that that is a, a constructive way in which to explore whether or not perfecting amendments are needed. And I've already seen the work product of some of the senators in that regard. And I think the process is working. The Senate's working as it should. Um, but um, I just wanted to let you know that, that I am willing and, re and ready, if not eager, uh, to, to take my seat and to listen to what my colleagues have to say about this. But that said, I'm willing to stand up here and answer questions for as long as the members think that's useful. Senator from Orangeburg, Senator Tato, what purpose do you rise? Well, I don't want to be in front of you taking your seat for too long, but I do have a couple of questions. Was the Senator yield for question? Yes. Senator yields. One of the criticisms or in the discussion uh, over the days have been uh, that uh, the, the FDA has not approved marijuana. Isn't that right? That's some of the members' concerns about the bill um, are that um, even though 37 states have legalized it for medicinal use and even though there are lots of peer-reviewed studies indicating that it's medically efficacious for certain conditions, that we still ought not to allow it unless and until the FDA has approved the drug as it does other drugs. So uh, are you aware that the FDA does not uh, supervise the practice of medicine? I, I am, and, um, and, and in one of the ways I think that's, that's evidenced is that um, physicians, um, those that are in the best position sitting down with a patient and consulting with the patient and the patient's families, um, are given deference, for instance, to um, provide uh, off-label drug use. So, so even if a, a, a drug has been approved by the FDA for a specific condition and deemed safe for treatment of that specific condition, that doesn't trump the physician's ability to assign or prescribe that FDA drug for, for non-approved purposes. So essentially what they're doing is they're relying upon their clinical experience. They're, they're relying upon what they're observing with that patient. And they're not allowing that FDA, quote unquote, steal approval saying it can only be used for this to constrain them. And I, and I think it's a recognition by um, the FDA and by Congress um, who has consistently upheld physicians' rights um, to prescribe off-label drug use that that relationship, physician and patient, is the primary one. And I think there's analogy here in that cannabis, even though it's not FDA approved, should be able to be prescribed or authorized for use by a physician if that physician sitting down with that patient determines it's in that patient's best interest. And I guess, to your point, off-label prescribing is analogous to that. And it, it's legal. Off-label prescribing is done all the time. Is that right? It, it, it is. And, and in fact, I, I looked up, um, there is an American Medical Association Journal of Ethics um, uh, opinion on this that was, was handed down in 2016 talking about the practice of off-label uh, drug prescribing and, and noting that it accounts for up to 10 to 20 percent of all written prescriptions. So what that says to me is that in, in 10 to 20 percent of instances where a physician is deciding what's in that patient's best interest, that physician is making a decision that's not FDA approved. Um, it's not been FDA you know, sanctioned, it's not been FDA reviewed, there's no seal of approval from the FDA saying it's safe, and yet physicians do that because it's recognized that a physician sitting across from a patient reviewing that particular patient's history is the ultimate decider. And, and the reason I think that that's important for us to realize here is this bill is all about that. And, and there's been some discussion um, in recent days about how we shouldn't be a legislature authorizing or prescribing medicine, or we ought not be determining what is medicine. And, and, and what I try to keep bringing the body's attention back to is we're not doing that. Well, in fact, what we're doing is getting out of that. We're, we're, we're empowering doctors and we're saying it doesn't make any sense for us as politicians to stand in, the, in that relationship and to constrain the physician from doing what that physician thinks might be in that patient's best interest. So contrary to what you're hearing out there by some, this is not the legislature imposing itself in medicine. 
is the legislature getting out of that and recognizing that is the physician's the one that's best able to make that determination? And in fact, we're, we're going further than that. We're saying we're not going to just leave it up to the patient to decide whether they think it'll work or not. They actually have to go to a doctor and not only uh, be diagnosed with one of the, the uh, recognized uh, uh, symptoms, not, um, uh, I guess, maladies that this might be prescribed for, and then the doctor has to make the decision to actually prescribe it. Because just because you have one of those conditions that might qualify you, a doctor may say, I don't think in your case that's right. Because oftentimes, did you know doctors will try one thing, and then they may try something else, and then they may try something else. And sometimes, among the things that they try are off-label uses of drugs that aren't approved by the FDA for that particular uh, issue. That, that, that's absolutely right. And, and I tried to make the point the other day, and, and, and perhaps not as clearly as I should, but, but of the 12 qualifying conditions where we list cancer and epilepsy and neurological disorders and chronic pain and Crohn's disease and whatever, all, the, the entire list, it is enti not only entirely possible, it is, it is almost a certainty that in many instances, despite those conditions being listed in here and despite there being peer-reviewed scientific studies that say they could be efficacious, a physician may decide, given this patient's history, um, it is not the right thing for you. And, and I think, you know, that's reflected by the fact that some individuals have severe reactions to marijuana. For instance, if you have a disposition toward um, a psychotic break or schizophrenia, I mean, it's not a good idea to take cannabis. Um, it can exacerbate that condition. And, and so that's why it's so important for, for that physician to have that inpatient diagnosis or in-person diagnosis of that patient. And then let's trust the people that are trained to do this to make those judgments. And, and that's what this bill is all about, is empowering that physician. And, 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 and it's going to also be about um, bringing another medical professional into the loop, the pharmacist, the, the pharmacist who can interact with that patient. And, and I would submit that physician, patient, that relationship, patient, um, pharmacist, that relationship, and then looping back to the physician, that is where these medical decisions need to be made. And um, I, what I don't understand is this, this lack of faith that some have in a physician and a patient's ability sitting across from each other to decide what's in that patient's best interest. I mean, to me, that's what liberty and freedom and, and is all about, is, is about empowering individuals. And, and weren't you, I think you were involved in the uh, medical affairs hearings we had during the fall, and we, we discussed exactly that in connection with COVID, where we were saying, let's trust doctors to try the things that they think are in their patient's best interest. And it was, what I heard then was, yes, we should not be not we should not be getting in the way of doctors prescribing what they think is appropriate under the circumstances, even if it may not be FDA approved. And, and that was, and again, there's an analogy here with, with, with cannabis in that, and the argument was made, and you were on that committee, and, and I was on that committee, um, and the doctors came forward and made very persuasive arguments that we, we prescribe things off-label all the time. We're, we're in positions of deciding what's in the patient's best interest. We don't like to have federal medical bureaucracy is however well-intentioned telling us down at the local level what we think is in our patient's best interest. And I think that's a compelling argument. I mean, I, I mean I'm, I'm a politician and I'm a real estate lawyer. I, I, I'm not in a position to be able to tell a doctor what they can and can't do. And, and what we ought to be all about, in my opinion, is making sure that the laws that we pass get out of that relationship and, and let them have that one-on-one -on -one determination of what's in the patient's best interest. And that's, I guess that's what this bill is all about. And so I, I guess the ironic thing is, is that some in opposition would say, this is the legislature trying to step in and be a doctor. And what I would say is, no, it's our recognition of the fact that we aren't and that we ought not be constraining doctors from doing what they think is in their patient's best interest. That, that's right. Let me, let me shift, shift to another area. I know you've drafted this bill to basically be revenue neutral as it relates to, to the state. Is that correct? The way that, the way that it's phrased, um, it, it authorizes or empowers DHEC to impose a series of, of, of fees. It also recognizes that there's a sales tax. And the, the declared intent is that the fees should only be such that would cover it, the cost of administering the program. It's not meant right. to be a revenue raiser. Right. But the other part of it is 
Because there are going to be people that set up businesses and employ workers, and there are going to be farmers who plant crops, and there are going to be manufacturers who manufacture the crops. It is going to provide economic impact to South Carolina, not because of taxes or fees that we will collect, but just because of revenue that will be generated by the actual a new business being established in this state. Is that right? There, there's no question. I mean, the, the economic impact um, to the state in regard to the creation of jobs is, is absolutely huge. And, and, and so, um, interestingly, that's why of the 37 states that have legalized cannabis for medical purposes, not one of them has rolled back a program. Not one of them has said, wait a minute, there have been unintended consequences, we need to revisit this. Not one of them has said we made the wrong decision. I think, and that's 37 states, so it's very telling. So, so when we're told out there that these parade of horribles is going to occur if we pass medical cannabis, my argument back is point to a medical cannabis law in a state whereby that has been the case and the General Assembly of that state has rolled things back. It hasn't happened. I mean, these things just aren't, aren't real, which is why you don't see the claims that are made in some of the emails and Facebook ads and all these things that are out there. They're never footnoted to studies. They're never footnoted to, to states that have changed those laws. It's just fear-based. It's, 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 it's rhetoric, and, and what I've tried to do is, is I've tried to walk through and say, okay, this is what the law is. This is what federal law is. The CSA is not uh, preempt the field. On its face, it says it doesn't preempt the field. It invites the states to take actions in the space of controlled substances. I, I've talked about the case law that says adoption of medical cannabis laws doesn't even constitute implied preemption either. So there is no federal restriction in regard to us acting, and that's borne out by the fact that 37 states have them and their laws aren't, aren't challenged. And, and so you and I had the opportunity to go up to Maryland and look at uh, a state-of-the-art grow house. Actually, it looked like it was inside of a, of a mall. Um, you would think it might be out in a field, but this was an inside grow house that we visited. Is that right? We did, and, and um, I, I wish every member would have the opportunity to go and see what, what these um, growing facilities look like. I mean, it's like walking into a, a, a giant laboratory. I mean, and it's... Absolutely, and, and one of the things that struck me is that the head of the growing part was a Clemson graduate. Well, I was about to say that, that there were two people well, there. Well, the head I, of the lab was a College of Charleston it, it, graduate. We had two of South Carolina's best and brightest in, in terms of, of molecular biology and science, and they were up there employed as, as scientists working with uh, the grow, um, diagnosing what the strains were, what the CBD and the THC ratios were, doing research in regard to, okay, this sort of ratio will help with uh, chronic pain. This sort of ratio tends to help with nausea. This, this kind of ratio tends to stimulate appetite for those who have had chemotherapy. I mean, and, and what I want is instead of our best and brightest going to other states and working those facilities, have them here and have that intellectual capital here in South Carolina. These were students that, that we had helped pay for their college education because they both attended public universities yeah. in South Carolina. And their chosen field, they can't do here in South Carolina. They actually were testing different strains uh, versus different maladies and illnesses. They were, one, I mean, I, as I recall, uh, if you could remember, they, they would have, uh, a, a different strain, I call it a strain, a different mm -hmm. variety of marijuana, and they would test it to see whether it affected sleep or whether it affected people with PTSD or wh whatever. Uh, and, and so they were trying to focus particular strains of the plant on particular problems that people would, ha would have. It's, it's, it was really extraordinary, and, and it, 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 it really challenges us to rethink the notion of medicine in that What's different about cannabis and, and how it addresses some of these various conditions as opposed to what pharmaceuticals do, it interacts with the body. It interacts with the body's endocannabinoidal system and it attacks the imbalances that manifest themselves in these, in these conditions. And so it is a, it is a holistic way of, of going about. And, and look, there's a reason why 37 states have passed this. Even in the face, in each one of those states, you had law enforcement, um, opposed to it in those states. You had the religious community opposed to it saying you're going to be on a slippery slope to, to widespread marijuana use. I mean, all those, that opposition was there. This isn't different in South Carolina. And, and yet, 
in the end, they pass the laws because the science is clear, the logic is clear, the, the, the governmental philosophy is clear. I mean, we want to give primacy to that patient-physician relationship. I mean, that's all very compelling stuff. And, and, and to those who are opposed to this bill, I would pose this question, what right is there, what right does the state have to step into that relationship and say, nope, I'm sorry, I don't care about all the studies that say this is efficacious. I don't care about all the, the personal stories you've heard about how relief is being provided. We're not going to let you do that. That's the practice of medicine. That, that, that proscription in our code is the practice of medicine. So I, I just, I mean, when I read it, it, it just infuriates me saying Senator Davis thinks he knows better than doctors. Senator Davis wants to stand up there and, 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 and talk about what patients should take for their conditions. Nothing could be further from the truth if you read the bill. What I'm doing is empower, what we're doing, hopefully, is empowering physicians in getting the state out of that role because it doesn't belong there. And do you recall that when we uh, visited the distribution center, not the growth center, but the distribution center, that it wasn't in a seedy neighborhood? It was right there on a, on a highway right next to a lot of other businesses. It, 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 was, it was, as I recall, a $15 million, uh, the, the growth facility was a $15 million facility with state-of-the-art technology. I know Chairman Verdon was there as well, and, and others may have, may have visited these facilities. It is, and, and, and even under this bill, it's an extremely regulated, clean, scientific thing because we're talking about medicine. And, and, and in this bill, um, we're talking about it being tested by an independent lab. We're talking about it put in child-resistant packaging. We're talking about it being labeled. We're talking about having pharmacists be involved in the dispensing. We're treating this as we should like medicine. And, and when we went to the place where uh, patients would show up, they had to show their ID to come inside. They, we ended, we were able, they allowed us to talk to people. A lot of them were veterans. We, we, it's not like we walked up and there were just tons of hippies walking no. in. These were, we were, these were folks, some had canes, some told us about the PTSD they'd suffered from being involved in the, in the military. And these folks, were telling us what relief they got from this. They all had prescriptions and walked in, showed their ID, and then there was a, uh, a, an assistant, I don't know, I guess they weren't really pharmacists, but there was a tech, not tech uh, person there who could kind of walk them through options about whether you wanted this or you wanted that and what particular strains might, might treat. And uh, you remember also that we went back and watched how they handled the money, and they had to track all of that you know, to the penny, they had to track that because at the time, back then, they couldn't even, I guess, deposit it directly into banks. They had to have like an armored car come around and pick up the... And so the point is, this was very much a, a business that was run in the open and transparently when we viewed that facility in Maryland. Isn't that right? A absolutely. And when you mention meeting the PTSD patients that go in there, um, I, I want to make this point maybe clearer than I have in, in the past few days. There's been a lot of talk about the consequences of what might happen if we pass this bill, societal ills. I, I don't think there's any credible evidence for that, but we've talked a lot about the consequences of, of acting. We haven't focused enough on the consequences of not acting. And, 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 and the suicides that are occurring out there right now, we know this from PTSD veterans who have lost, who've seen, talked to their comrades and they just can't take it anymore. By not acting, by not acting, we are perpetuating that cycle of suicides, of, of people who put themselves in harm's way for us. We're making people like Margaret Richardson, in her words, creep around like a criminal and have to go out and buy marijuana, and she doesn't know what's going to be in it, but she has to buy it because it's the only thing that works for her. And, and, and our challenge here, and one that I know we're going to meet, figuring out a way to safely get that medicine in the hands of people who desperately need it. And, and, and that has been the objective all along in this. It's why it's called the Compassionate Care Act. And, you know, and these emails, for some reason, that Drew McKissick at the Republican Party seeks emailing out on behalf of sheriffs, ostensibly, although they're all cut and pasted, so you know it's drafted by, by one person, starts out the letter. The first one said, don't get me wrong, I'm compassionate. This latest one said, don't get me wrong, I'm extremely compassionate. Well, guess what? Compassion is demonstrated through acts, not words, okay? You can't on the one hand say that you're extremely compassionate and on the other hand fight the adoption of a law 
that would get medicine in the hand of veterans, get medicine in the hand of people who are in the aftermath of chemotherapy, medicine in the hand of a child who is suffering hundreds of seizures an hour, just they're twitching on the ground because it won't work when we know cannabis can address it. I mean, there are consequences, Senator from Orangeburg, to us not acting. And I think we're oblivious to some of those. And one of those is that an alternative, that if you don't allow this, is you, you give doctors and patients the, the potential that they're going to prescribe them an opioid. And, 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 and the opioids, go, go, you're going to go and, down a whole other... And that's the other thing, is that... And, and again, we have the experience of looking at states that have had this in place for decades. We know there is an undeniable direct correlation, nobody can challenge it, between the availability of medical cannabis and the decrease in the number, amount of opioids that are prescribed and the decrease in the amount of opioid overdoses. These are deaths that can be prevented. And so again, there are consequences for us not acting, okay? And I recall uh, one of our committee meetings talking to uh, a veteran who had an array of pills that he was taking. It, he said he could get rid of all of those if he could get marijuana. So number one, somebody's paying for that, either on, in his insurance or through Medicaid or Medicare or TRICARE or whatever he is on, somebody's paying for all that medicine. All of that could be cut out as a savings to the overall healthcare system if he could just get the most effective medicine that he needs, which was prescription marijuana. No, no question about that. I mean, there's so many, again, and, and, and I'm glad we're having this exchange, uh, particularly in regard to the off-labeling, because people seem to be praying to the FDA God, okay? As if, as if somehow the FDA is going to stamp this thing, and that's got to be the be-all and end-all, and that's the way you access medicine. And the point is that a non-FDA-approved drug for a condition can be prescribed by a doctor if, in that doctor's opinion, it can be efficacious. We always defer. We always defer to that doctor down there with that patient, as we ought. Because if something is FDA approved, that doesn't mean a doctor has to prescribe it. No, of course not. And, and they don't do that now. So that's the point I wanted to start, I think I started out with. The FDA does not control the practice of medicine. And, and in fact, um, when Congress, um, uh, when FDA periodically tries to rein in off-label prescribing, Congress steps in and has, quote, repeatedly taking legal steps to prevent the FDA from interfering with the practice of medicine. Okay, so, so the FDA doesn't like it. I mean, any, any bureaucracy is going to like power, right? right? They don't like the fact that physicians off-label prescribe, um, but Congress repeatedly says, you're not involved in the practice of medicine, FDA, and we're not going to take away the authority from that physician down at that patient level if that physician believes it's in that patient's best interest. And again, I keep coming back to that because th this whole bill was drafted with that in mind. This is our bill. It isn't California's bill. It's not Colorado's bill. Our, our committee decided that what we wanted to do was empower physicians, respecting that relationship, and trying to figure out a way to give them options in the event that prescription drugs don't address the conditions. And, and so I, I, I'm proud of this legislation. I think it's legislation South Carolinians can be proud of. Heck, it's what South Carolinians are saying they want us to do. Um, by, by over like 70 percent. Well, and, 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 and oh, but. Even without, you know, just a bald question, do you favor legalizing marijuana, f uh, you know, for, for, for medicinal use, you get a majority. Um, I think it's 60 percent to 40 percent, something like that. But to your point, when you do pushes, when you say, would your opinion change, would you be more likely to favor it if you knew it reduced in opioid overdoses? Would you be more likely to be in favor of it if you knew it helped individuals in the aftermath of cancer? Would you be more? And it goes off the charts you know, let more likely. You know what doesn't move them? Is when they're said, would you be more likely or less likely if you knew law enforcement opposed it? Would you be more likely or less likely if you knew that the uh, religious social conservatives opposed That doesn't change their minds. What, what moves people is being educated as to what the, thing, what the medicine can do. And, and I think the people are way ahead of us on this, okay? They are, and the reason they're ahead of us is most of them have family members, most of them have personal first-hand experience of how cannabis has changed a life. Most of them know somebody like a Margaret Richardson, okay, who, who knows they don't have any alternatives, who know they're going out there and buying marijuana illegally because they have to. They don't know what's in it. They don't know what adulterants are in, and it's a horrible way for, for us to set public policy. And so I, so I, I, I want to focus on the effects of us not acting are, because those effects of our not acting 
are, are multitudinous and undeniable, unlike the fears of what might happen if we do act. And so what you just pointed out is that what moves people when they think about it, is they're moved by the science, not by the soundbite. Absolutely, and, and what, what's been remarkable to me, despite this, this, this full-scale effort by the South Carolina Republican Party cutting, pasting, you know, mistruths, quite frankly, and sending it out there, I have not received, you know, 100 to 1, they're saying, stay the course, Senator Davis, don't believe those lies. I mean, follow the science, do what's best for patients, empower doctors. I mean, it's just sort of like when they sent that, that flyer out there with me wearing that Hawaiian shirt. I mean, it didn't hurt me. It doesn't hurt me because people understand this. And, and, you they're look, not, and you look good in it. And I did. They, they got a good picture of me. And, and the thing... The thing of it is, this, people's real-world experience isn't matching up with what they're being told here. And people aren't stupid, okay? They know, they know in talking with families and friends and themselves, they understand, okay? And they're not going to be persuaded, I don't think, by mass emails cut and pasted by the Republican Party with a sheriff's name slapped at the end. I just don't think that's going to do well, it. Well, I, I don't either. And I thank you for your hard work on this. And I, I guess we will see what some of the opposition has to say. Thank you.